Hi, welcome to episode six of my series on Thomas Kuhn's classic work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Um, this episode is going to continue where we left off in the last episode, and it's going to explore section five, or chapter five of Kuhn's book, The Priority of Paradigms. Now, if you've been with me so far, you know where we're at, but if you're joining me for the first time, let me give you a sense of what we're discussing. In the first five episodes of this series, I've sought to characterize first the historical and contemporary significance of this book by Thomas Kuhn. I pointed out this is the most cited academic book by many counts of the 20th century, and it's the most influential book probably published about science in the 20th century. Um, Kuhn's book is therefore a classic that's regularly assigned in courses in the history and philosophy of science and the sociology of science. That's the academic and contemporary significance. But as we've seen in the last two episodes, Kuhn's book speaks to a very urgent need of our contemporary world, which is to come to an ability for all humans, regardless of their direct participation in the scientific enterprise, to have a really deep appreciation of it, ideally an interest in it, and a desire in some ways to understand and contribute to it. And the reason that's very important is because science isn't um, a simple thing. Science turns out to be the most complicated, um, organized enterprise of the human species um, around a single activity for a sustained period of time. Humans have had religious organizations of different sorts. Humans have had um, organizations designed around political families, dynasties, territories, but these tend to disappear and when they disappear, their influence is definitively in the past. Scientific communities are pursuing knowledge. And one of the features, it seems, of scientific knowledge and of all knowledge is that it lasts. It abides through time. The insights of Isaac Newton, although they have been reformulated under the pressure, you could say, of the development of Einstein's theory of special and general relativity, where the general relativity is unifying, in a sense, Newton's achievements, but correcting them and refining them in light of Einstein's prior achievements, Newton's achievements still have a kind of relative validity. Um, whereas uh, something that just disappears, a religious community that disappeared 300 years ago, most people who aren't part of that community don't know about it. But Newton gave us laws, laws that are still very useful to calculate all kinds of practical things. Um, in his case, trying to understand the way in which um, the planets uh, orbited in, the, in relationship to the Earth, say the moon in particular. Um, of course, if you know anything about Newton, you know he could calculate up to two bodies, but left what's now called the three-body problem. But Newton made definitive, permanent contributions to human understanding. And this permanence of science is one of the great, almost spiritually inspiring things about it, is the idea that by contributing to science, you could... Build for yourself an eternal name. Uh, build for yourself a lasting name. And science therefore became, in the 20th century in particular, but it developed like this in the 17th, 18th, and the 19th century began to really change. It became an image of what a type of ideal human being was. You see this in the hagiography or the sort of very um, admiring um, writing about Isaac Newton as if he were a type of saint it, beginning in his own lifetime. In fact, the uh, critical biographies of scientific geniuses like Newton often take a long time to emerge. And it's very difficult to get an accurate historical understanding of people who are as famous as Newton is, for example, because there's a sense in which we admire their godlike achievement. We admire it exactly because even though they have died, the community that they've contributed to still venerates them and they've given something that lasts. And we saw with the example of Edward Witten, a great string theorist who's at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, we saw that this desire for a lasting contribution is linked, including in Witten's own mind, it's linked to the desire for a final theory of science or a desire to contribute to something that has permanent value that can be complete and lasting. And this is a great motivator, not for all scientists, but for many scientists, I think particularly scientists in math and mathematical physics, for example. So the significance of Kuhn's book is that it really is, in a way, a shared introduction that anyone with a proper um, introduction, which I'm trying to give here publicly, as a contribution to the community of everyone interested in science, we can come to some appreciation of the significance of Kuhn's book, 
And therefore, we can come to some deep grappling with the significance of science itself for the human species. And therefore, studying scientific knowledge, to me, is almost like if you were a religious person studying theology, in the sense that it's not it's not that the theology, as it were, the ideas of your religious tradition aren't interesting to people outside of the tradition. But if you're inside of the tradition, you don't think of them as ideas. You think of them as the truth. You think of them as the core insights of reality. And in science, what's exciting about science is if something's scientific, it's claiming that it's getting us closer to reality. And deep down, you could say we are living through a revolution in which we consciously care about whether what we believe is true or not. We consciously care about whether or not our fundamental commitments make sense. And so if someone says, well, your beliefs are unscientific, no one really likes that description. Very few groups today would say, well, I'm fine with that. Contrary, for example, to many people's ideas about uh, Christian fundamentalists, who believe in young earth creationism, they're not anti-scientific. Um, their ideas about biology are, of course, not in accord with contemporary scientific um, paradigms about biology. But there are many people with PhDs in biology who are in those circles. And that can seem very puzzling if you don't know, for example, the work of Michael Ruse or others who carefully study these communities sympathetically, even though, of course, very critically. Um, but the young earth creationist movement is a type of rationalization of a certain era of theology, but it is a rationalization. In other words, it's an attempt to give very good reasons for a position that to the broader scientific community looks quite understandably absurd because it's ignoring all of the history, for example, starting with geology, with Lyle in particular, that shows the earth is very old. But so you could say, and this is where the coon gets abused, this is a very good example, some young earth creationists would say, well, they just have a different paradigm. So you see, part of the usefulness of Kuhn is to know, is that really a legitimate extension of the idea? And I've explained in the last few episodes why it's not what Kuhn means by a paradigm. Young Earth creationism is not a paradigm in biology. But insofar as it's a community of people who are, say, dissenting um, for their religious convictions from the scientific consensus, it's a community. And we saw that the term paradigm has this crucial ambiguity that has to do with its origins um, and it, its influences. And so today, in exploring the nature of paradigms further in this section, the priority of paradigms, I'm going to really back out and explore the significance of what Kuhn's trying to do in this chapter or section, because I think this section becomes somewhat confusing. And I think it's because Kuhn's really wrestling with difficult ideas that he's trying to understand about what the nature of a paradigm is and how it relates to, say, transitions in belief amongst communities. And this is, I think, this has always been um, Kuhn's first greatest influence on me. The, the topic of how communities change their beliefs, I think, is one of the most important topics. I would say, for example, that outside of my academic work as a scholar or as a philosopher in the intellectual sense um, that's engaging ideas and books in the contemporary uh, academic community, in philosophy as a way of life, and particularly in the consulting I've done, the institutional building I'm doing and have done, Kuhn has always been very influential. I first read him when I was 18 years old. In the same year, I read uh, a book by Quine, a great analytic philosopher and logician. And I also read uh, Clifford Geertz's The uh, Interpretation of Cultures. And they came together, Quine, Geertz, and Kuhn came together in a very powerful way. Um, I feel like I was very lucky, blessed to have read them all the same semester my freshman year. Um, and I recognized very early on that thinking about Kuhn in conjunction, say, with an anthropologist like Clifford Geertz helped me understand that um, one of the general problems Kuhn is raising is how we understand the rationality or irrationality of belief change. And so why do people change beliefs? Let me give you an example that can almost seem controversial now, but uh, there, our beliefs in American society um, change very rapidly. So for example, when President Obama um, was running for his second term, he had not declared a clear position on the issue of gay marriage, which now of course has been settled by the Supreme Court. But at the time, um, Obama didn't have a clear position. He was supportive very broadly in the community knew that, but because it was controversial pragmatically, I think, with much of the Democratic moderate voter base at the time, he was uncertain about a full commitment. Then Vice President Joseph Biden on the Charlie Rose show, if I remember right, because I was w watching the show at the time, 
um, talked about his daughter, who's a lesbian, and um, basically made it very clear that the White House supported uh, the gay community and their desire f for the right to gay marriage. And internally, there was a lot of reporting, of course, that the White House, Obama, was probably quite annoyed in the sense that his vice president had forced a policy position that he had been trying to be diplomatic about. I say that because it's, if you remember that Obama, who we think of as a model progressive, when he became the president in his first term, he wasn't clearly supporting gay marriage. Now we take this for granted, and it's been less than 20 years. And so people today who are very young have grew up in this, you could say, post-Biden era where we haven't had a president um, in the White House since Obama, who really seriously opposed gay marriage or the right for gay people to have it. And then again, Obergefell versus Hodges settled this. If you look at that from the standpoint of American culture, you see American culture for basically its entire history, like most of the um, Christian Western world, had opposed the idea of gay marriage insofar as it had even come up. And then kind of, it seems like overnight, uh, we changed on this issue, but it's not overnight. If you study the history of activism and of gay activism, right, there's been activists for a very long time who were making the changes and the sacrifices necessary for this cultural transformation to happen. And it required a lot of strategy, a lot of organizing, a lot of work in the academy. And no one who just sees the change knows that. We just now take it for granted that we live in a world in which gay marriage is acceptable. And therefore, we don't think about how did that become possible? It's a radical shift in the beliefs and mores of a culture, for example. And it creates a lot of tension with non-Western, non-progressive cultures. Um, it creates a tension. And we see that, for example, with Hungary, Orban, tr traditional religious societies uh, have a very difficult time with this aspect of contemporary Western culture. But we've accepted it. And that's an example of a major belief change. It's not scientific. In this case, you would say it's moral. Um, but it's, a, it's an incredibly, therefore, important topic. How do you make sense of the transformation of communities beliefs. Um, why do we believe some things and not others? And in order to understand that, we recognize Kuhn's book, I think, is one of the great resources. And I'm mentioning this because this chapter and what he introduced in the chapter I discussed last week in the last episode, this chapter really is trying to make sense foundationally of the topics you need to understand for interpreting belief change. So in this case, Kuhn's talking about rules which he says are less fundamental than a paradigm because you can have a paradigm without rules that explicitly govern research. But then he says rules are sometimes very important and particularly rules are very important when theory change is imminent, when there's a scientific revolution brewing, when a paradigm is breaking down, for example. So Kuhn says in this chapter, I'll give you this passage, he says that um, rules therefore become important and the characteristic unconcern about them should vanish whenever paradigms or models are felt to be insecure. So in other words, when for some reason the scientific theory or paradigm of the community becomes insecure, the issue of what are the rules that govern how science operates, what are the rules that govern how our particular scientific community operates, they become an important topic. And he goes on to say, that is, moreover, exactly what does occur. The pre-paradigm period in particular is regularly marked by frequent and deep debates over legitimate methods, problems, and standards of solution, though these serve rather to define schools than to produce agreement. So this is a really important uh, passage from Kuhn's book. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the significance of this passage in two ways. First of all, I'm going to um, give an example from, I think, the background to what Kuhn's doing, which I mentioned in the last episode, which is I'll briefly discuss this book by Ludwig Fleck, um, who Kuhn cites in the beginning of the book as a major influence on his book. Secondly, I'll use the very, I, I admire very much, the very interesting mathematical physicist and I would say science, I guess, educator, teacher, Sabina uh, Hassenfelder, and I'll use her work related to her book, Lost in Math, that's the English tradition. The German title's uh, sort of funnier, it's much literally uglier, um, which is the ugly science, I think it is. Uh, 
in German or the ugliness of science. But I'll use Sabina Hassenfelder's critique of contemporary science as a perfect example, I think, of what Kuhn's talking about. And I'll use Kuhn, therefore, and Hassenfelder to show we clearly are in a series of revolutions and different paradigms. And therefore, we have a lot of debate currently about what are the proper rules for legitimate science. So Kuhn is very useful diagnostically here to help us understand contemporary science. And I'll use Hassenfelder's ideas to develop some of my own. And so that'll be the, the sort of latter half of the episode. Let me start with just a very brief sort of um, five minute introduction to this book, um, which I mentioned last week. I meant to check whether there's an English translation of it. If there is, it's certainly very hard to find. I've never seen one. There may be one though, so I apologize. Uh, I'll get that information before I publish the video. But this book is called The Entstehung and Entwicklung einer Wissenschaftlichen Tatsache, which means roughly the origin and development of a scientific fact. And very crucially, its subtitle is Einführung in die Lehre von Denkstil und Denkkollektiv, an introduction to the doctrine of the thought style and thought collective, which are these two concepts I introduced um, from Fleck. Now, this, as I mentioned, connected to Kuhn's concept of the paradigm as a community. I don't think Kuhn was at all wrong to not directly engage Fleck's work sort of in footnotes. But I think if you want a deep understanding of Kuhn, it's very helpful to have a serious um, basic knowledge of what's going on in Fleck because you then see a lot of the difficulties of Kuhn, I think in very innovative, important sections where he's really trying to break ground and make progress. He's trying to think through problems in his own way using the paradigm concept that I think are emerging probably in his mind first from reading Fleck. And so let me start with Fleck's central idea, which is, Ludwig Fleck's book is about the nature of a fact. And you could say, well, section five, the priority of a paradigm isn't about facts. It's not explicitly about facts, but it sets up the next section, which introduces the idea of anomalies. And in the idea of anomalies, we'll see, we already need to kind of be thinking about the very interesting problem of what is a scientific fact. Now that can seem like an extremely obvious question, but it's not. Um, Fleck was a a Jewish um, scientist and a specialist in the history of medicine, he was also a doctor himself, I believe, who published this book in 1935 and in the conditions of persecution by uh, the German government at the time. And it's a it's a really an extraordinary book. I I, I I would like to at some point teach a course on it and, you know, then maybe have Kuhn as the second book because I think that would be a really deep way to do an advanced study of of Kuhn, but let me just give you uh, the sense of how the book works. The, the book works by starting off with a case study from the history of medicine, which is what is syphilis? What is the concept of this diagnostic category syphilis? Um, and so the book starts with a simple um, question, what is a fact? And he says, you know, we basically think about facts as abiding, sort of remaining, um, independent of subjective opinion. Um, they are the sort of objective results of scientific research, independent of all of our subjectivity. And he points out that this is the common idea of a fact. And in, indeed, this I would say is what you could say is the kind of internal idea of a fact is within a paradigm, within a scientific community. And here we should just use with uh, Fleck's word, within a denk collective or within a thought collective specific facts are possible and uncontroversial, but facts themselves are highly complex, particularly scientific facts. And so what Fleck does is he uses in the first chapter a case study about the history of syphilis to show how incredibly complicated the concept of syphilis is. And one of the interesting things he notes, for example, is that from the 17th century to the 19th century to the time he was writing, there were always very distinguished doctors who were experts on syphilis who denied that syphilis was a real disease distinct from other diseases. And so if you know anything about the history of medicine, or psychiatry is a really egregious example of this, very famously you could say made thanks to Foucault, but also if you're a radical and you know the work of someone like Saz, you know, you know about some of this stuff. But basically, if you study the history of medicine, it is confusing very quickly because the simple fact is people aren't sick with the same diseases uh, today that they were sick with 300 years ago or 500 years ago or a thousand years ago. 
And when you really look at the history of medicine, you end up always having to study the history of what we would call religion or spirituality, mythology, um, because healing has always been connected to humans' deepest ideas about guilt, about shame, um, about the cosmos, about the gods. And in the modern scientific world, that seems crazy to us. And we think, therefore, there's no influence of that. But we know there's actually a very deep influence. We know, for example, there's still a very deep connection between being sick and having guilt. I know I've had a very severe autoimmune disorder for over a decade, and it's very difficult dealing with severe illness, um, illness that can be disfiguring, illness that causes pain. You wonder, why is this happening to me? And um, the, that's not just the subjective question. Often we feel blamed. Think about how many people make us feel blamed for being sick or blamed for things. Maybe we should be blamed. Maybe we shouldn't. But if we're honest, we know contemporary medicine still has, you could say, a strongly moralistic aspect where we wonder, are we responsible for our illness? What are we supposed to do about it? So... What he then does in the rest of the book is he develops, I think, in a very profound way, using these concepts, the Denk Collective, the Thought Collective, and the Denk Stil, the Thought Style, he develops the characteristic of the scientific community, which, as we've seen, is not, as we commonly thought in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, is not a history of great individuals, but is the history, you could say, of communities over time in which great individuals emerge and they shape those communities but their ideas in turn are reshaped by their reception in those communities and by the development of that community. So therefore, scientific knowledge is very special. It's capable somehow of both remaining the same in some ways and also changing through time. And we saw in the last episode, if you um, joined me for that, I raised by the end this very challenging question, which is Kuhn's really trying to wrestle with the fact that he believes clearly there's progress in science. But when you look at a granular level at scientific theories, it's not continuous, it's not linear. They occur through revolutions. And so we've been building, building slowly, I hope patiently, but with interest and, and growing excitement towards, okay, so how does scientific change really happen? And in order to appreciate that, we need to appreciate this is Kuhn's concern about rules. So let me now give you an example about why this matters. If you just thought the scientific change was just communities changing their mind, say the way you might think of moral change, which is moral change is good and it's called progress if you are part of a community that believes the moral change which fit your views, um, then you think of its progress. If you're part of a moral community that thinks the new view is wrong, you think it's regressive. That's a sociological character of all communities that have significant differences about values. Now, scientific theorists are like this in their own way. They might say very critical things about people who have different theories or about how they're wrong or it's not even science. And we see today a massive crisis of exactly this kind, for example, in physics. Just search crisis in physics and look at how many um, things you'll find. And Sabina Hassenfelder, in a lecture that she gives in German on her book, which you can find under the English title, The Crisis or in Physics, or What is Physics in a Crisis? She has a number of lectures like that. You can watch in English or German or with subtitles. Um, she discusses this. And in Hassenfelder's view, there, there is clearly a crisis in physics. She's obviously correct about this. If you don't know about it, I've mentioned it in passing, but there's a b very big crisis. And as a result, someone like Sabina Hassenfelder comes along as a physicist and she says, what's going on here? And if you know anything about her work, um, you know what I'm about to tell you, but let me give you a brief summary. Her argument is that physics has been um, misled by its emphasis on aesthetics or beauty as a heuristic criterion or something to guide the development of theories or what theories you ought to defend. And said at that level of generality, I, I you know, used to be unsympathetic to her position, then I engaged her work and I realized I completely agree with her. And I think she's very perceptive and profound on the on this issue. Um, but you need to kind of watch at least a lecture's worth, if not get her book, to see what she means. But specifically, she looks at um, three different concepts that she says from her research and talking to physicists that she thinks many theoretical physicists in particular share about what beauty means. She talks about elegance, for example, and what it's characterized by. And then she shows how this is very misleading in the development of scientific theories. It leads us, she thinks, away from engagement with the empirical world, which can often be messy from this aesthetic standpoint. And you could say, well, why 
is that connected to our topic today with Kuhn? Well, quite clearly, when you read Section 5 in the Priority of Paradigms, and then you look at Sabina Hassefelder's work on the current crisis in physics, you can tell that what she's doing is making a heuristic intervention in physics. In other words, she's making an intervention at the level of the rules that govern physics. She's taking a problem, which is there's a stagnation. She says to crisis is too optimistic a word, good German. She says that it's really a stagnation. And she diagnoses the stagnation as arising from this sort of bad set of rules, Rules that say follow what you perceive subjectively as beautiful in theories. And then she critiques the concepts of simplicity, for example, that are active in physics. And she makes a very compelling case, for example, about the fact that the Higgs boson is the only thing that really emerged that was supposed to emerge from the hadron, Large Hadron Collider from the standard model. And that she talks about that comes all the way from the 1960s, the prediction for something like the Higgs boson. And so she uh, makes a very good case, I think, that the rules currently governing physics may be contributing to problems in physics. Now, again, I'm not a physicist, so I can't directly comment, as it were, on the specialized issue of whether the aesthetic criteria that Hausenfeld is talking about do mark contemporary physics. I find her persuasive. And at a higher level of generality, I can comment, which is sort of at the level of generality I'm teaching in this course, Kuhn's text shows us that uh, Hassenfeld is surely correct to ask the question, what are the rules that are governing what seem like a unproductive or sterile phase of science? And maybe we need to change the rules. So at the end of her book and at the end of her lectures on the book, she gives you kind of uh, recommendations for what we ought to be doing in science. So in other words, she's proposing new rules. And I would suggest this is a very profound and perfect example of what Kuhn says happens and when rules become important, is they become important when paradigms are insecure. And all of the talk about a crisis in physics and is there a role for philosophers and all this stuff is connected to the fact that science is in a very deep state of uncertainty. You know, one of the scientists who's very controversial, he's very brilliant. I had the privilege of interviewing uh, him, Avi Loeb, astrophysicist at Harvard, former chair for, I think, 10, 20 years of the Harvard Astronomy Department. Incredibly brilliant, published almost a thousand um, articles. And But he's interested in the topic of extraterrestrials, which obviously to some people is still very de classe. And, uh, but he makes the point in his work which is, of course, correct empirically, that were we to discover evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, it, w it would be a, a civilizational transforming moment. And assuming that the intelligence was higher than us, because it's using technology we don't understand, for example, have access to, he says, literally, you can le read this in his work, but also look at his most recent blog post, I think, from last week. He says that it would be a kind of salvation. And this connects to what I discuss at length in my um, series and course origins on the on the origins of how we think about science and religion. And I discussed it in this uh, series already, too, which is that there is a tendency for scientists to think of science in a way that can lead it to be the source of salvation. And from the standpoint of Avi Loeb, that's actually quite rational. Now, if like many of his physicist colleagues who critique him, um, you don't share his framework of interest, for example, in the importance of devoting scientific resources to looking for extraterrestrial, uh, the evidence of extraterrestrial existence and, or intelligence, then you see him as sort of quixotic um, um, or maybe something more negative. And again, I would never adjudicate those things, but you can see a real animosity in the current scientific community around, say, what should physics be doing? What should we be allocating money to? And in one sense, this is par for the course. But in another sense, if you listen to, for example, my interview with Avi Loeb, I'll link it in the video, you'll see that he's very concerned about a type of whole vision of science that he thinks is misguiding us. So he has a very different diagnosis than Sabina Hassenfelder. I don't know if he agrees with her or what he thinks about her work, if he's familiar with it. But he has his own diagnosis about, you could say, the rules that have gone wrong. And he provides his own heuristic maxims or rules, for example, about scientific funding, designed to show that the current paradigm is flawed and we need to look for a, a better theory that could become a true, a true paradigm.
So this this emphasis in the scientific community on conflict, Kuhn recognizes when the conflict reaches a certain level of depth, when the reigning theory or paradigm is insecure, you get a debate about what even is science and what do we need to be thinking should guide science and what is the point of scientific theorizing. And then it's sort of, as Kuhn rightly points out, there's a shift often from purely quantitative problems, even in quantitative fields like physics, to an additional set of qualitative problems or problems about what is the nature or quality of science? What is the nature or quality of physics? And this is connected. You could say, Sam, how is this connected to the idea of a fact? Well, it's connected very directly. But if you don't know the text of Kuhn yet, you, you wouldn't see this because it's it's by anticipation. But let me give you a passage um, from the chapter that's speaking to what I say. He says, um, scientists can agree with a Newton, a Lavoisier, a Maxwell, or Einstein has produced an apparently permanent solution to a group of outstanding problems and still disagree, sometimes without being aware of it, about the particular abstract characteristics that make these solutions permanent. Now, just bear with me. He said, what does that mean? He goes on to say very clearly, they can, that is, agree in their identification of a paradigm without agreeing on or even attempting to produce a full interpretation or rationalization of it. Now, this idea that you can agree on how to identify something broadly, but not how to interpret it, is exactly what's setting up, if you know this text, the issue of what is called now in the philosophy of science, partly thanks to Kuhn, the underdetermination of facts by theory. Now, I'm not going to explain that in detail today, but retrospectively, when I talk about the concept explicitly, you'll see we've been talking about it this whole episode. But the basic idea is not unique to science. It's actually quite interesting. It's take, for example, a text like Shakespeare, take a simple Shakespeare sonnet. Oh, well, there's no real innocent simple Shakespeare sonnet, but take a Shakespeare sonnet um, and ask two different Shakespearean scholars to characterize the sonnet, and you will get almost certainly two extremely different answers. Now, of course, they'll agree this is the Shakespeare sonnet number 122. They would agree here's the words that it contains. But when you ask them to use their own words to talk about what those words mean, they will be very different than each other. And they could even appear contradictory and maybe be genuinely contradictory. So scientific theories, this is a very important idea. And I think it's been very difficult, to be honest, for people in the sciences to grasp because this form of insight isn't part explicitly. I'm not saying it's not actually part, but it's not explicitly part of how we think about the natural sciences, which is we don't think of the natural sciences as interpretive. But you have to interpret everything. So the more mature a scientist becomes, the more you could say they're forming unconsciously, inchoately, they're forming their own interpretation of the dominant theory that they're working on, or they're forming their own interpretation of a problem. And for example, you could say that one of the things that characterizes original scientists is there is a shared set of problems, right? But um, if you share those problems, you will then think very differently. You'll use your own way of thinking. And people who are very outside of the mainstream, outside of the thought style of the thought collective, often are marginalized, even if their insights are valid, because their insights don't fit the style of thought of the moment. And this is something, for example, that Fleck really stresses. And we'll see that Kuhn will discuss this at length in the sections dealing with scientific revolutions and theory change explicitly, which is how do you respond to major forms of disagreement in the scientific community? And the concern for that is, what do you mean, how do we respond? It's how is it rational to respond? And this is then linked to this apparently simple question, what is a fact? And the simple fact is scientific facts are incredibly complex objects. Scientific facts are created, in a sense, by scientific theories. And they are subject to the interpretive differences that different interpretations of those theories will lead to. And they can then lead to different understandings. For example, Kuhn gives the example of the fact that the same facts will be interpreted differently in different scientific subspecialties. And he gives an example at the end of the chapter or the end of the section on uh, quantum mechanics. And he says that depending on what subfield you're in of physics, you'll have a very different view 
of quantum mechanics. So he says, um, consider, he says, as an example, the quite large and diverse community constituted by all physical scientists. Each member of that group today, he's writing in the 60s, is taught the laws of, say, quantum mechanics and most employ them at some point in their research or teachings, but they do not all learn the same applications. On the road to professional specialization, a few physical scientists encounter only the basic principles of quantum mechanics. Others study in detail the paradigm application of these principles to chemistry, still others to the physics of the solid state, and so on. What quantum mechanics means to each of them depends upon what courses he has had, what tests he has read, and which journal he studies. Kuhn's obviously using key, but... We today know should this include women and everyone. It follows that although a change in quantum mechanical law will be revolutionary for all of these groups, a change that reflects only one or another of the paradigm applications of quantum mechanics need be revolutionary only for the members of a particular professional subspecialty. Which as part of his point is there's small revolutions and he's starting off by showing us how do we think about small revolutions. And he's going to work very wisely, I think, from small revolutions, like in the subspecialty, to broad revolutions. And in his example, right, if you're part of the scientific community of physicists, but you don't really work on quantum mechanics really at all, you'll be exposed to it, you'll have a basic understanding of it. But if, say, there's a major change in, in the subfield of someone who really does use quantum mechanics all the time, and they have a particular application or interest in it, the revolution, whatever it is in quantum mechanics, will affect them very differently, much more directly, with much greater impact and maybe immediacy than it will affect the group of people who only basically learned uh, their quantum mechanics as part of their education, but they then went to specialize in something else. So the revolution will eventually affect them, but because it's starting small, it might not be perceived, and it won't be perceived the same way by the different communities that have different views. So this idea that the same fact is validly understood in different ways that don't often lead to understanding of each other is very important. Um, I had the privilege of working with a, a specialist, a, a leading specialist in soft matter physics, who was a contributor and advisor for our Meanings of Science project, Tom McLeish, a Cambridge-trained um, soft matter physicist. And you can see I did an interview with McLeish where he talks about, I think it's very, a very powerful, generous view about science that includes all of us. He thinks everyone is kind of capable of doing science and in a way is doing science. And McLeish, though, gives the example of the fact that his own field, soft matter physics, is apparently a relatively new field that, if I remember right, arose from sort of recognition and insights into the possible applications of some of the theory in math that, I, if I remember right, came from quantum field theory. So it's a fairly new theory, the, the physics he was involved in, soft matter physics, I mean, and it's influenced by this other newer theory that comes before it, I mean, quantum field theory. And this is an example where many people who don't know soft matter physics wouldn't know if there's a big change, say, in McLeish's field. He sadly recently passed away. Uh, last year around this time. But if you were in Tom's field and you saw a change in this field, you would see it up close and it would change your actual research life dramatically. Whereas another scientist may not hear about it for 30 years. So that's an example of how subspecialties, because paradigms can be so specialized, permit, you could say, local revolutions, like a sort of mayor, as it were, gets overthrown. If you want to use a political example, but people in another state may never have heard about that because even if it was reported in the media, uh, it would have been the local media, not in another state. But those revolutions, the bigger they are, the more quickly, as it were, they spread. But each community of the country, of any country, will interpret the meaning of it based on their regional interests, which right, may not be very significant. And if you have an event that happens in a country that changes the whole country, then you have a full-scale political revolution. And of course, that's something like what we see in the paradigmatic scientific revolutions, in Kuhn's case, that lead to paradigms like Newton or like Einstein. So the issue of what the rationality is of the scientific community becomes acute because apparently what is a normal type of disagreement among scientists about who's doing the right sort of theory becomes a very deep existential issue in periods of deep uncertainty in which then debates about what constitutes real science and how ought it to be done, like we see with Sabina Hossenfelder, Avi Loeb, and those who disagree with him, we see a lot of debates about what really is physics. 
um, how should people be thinking about physics? Just as we see again, I think a new paradigm is slowly emerging in biology in the life sciences more broadly. So the issue then of a fact is a single place to focus on. Does this single thing actually make sense? Um, does it make sense when you characterize a single thing from different perspectives? And one of the beautiful things we know from Kuhn is, of course, it does. It's not that different perspectives are invalid, but it is the case. And this is, I think, what's so hard for us to recognize as scholars and practitioners is it's valid to have different perspectives in science. Of course, that's part of specialization. In principle, it's not invalid, but it does lead to misunderstanding. And it would be, you could say, more ideal if scientists somehow were able to understand how their colleagues thought about it. And this is where McLeish was a great leader in interdisciplinary education. And if you look at his record, he had an extraordinary record. He was a you know, member of the Royal Society and was actively involved in um, programs to sort of change the public thinking about science and make a more inclusive vision of science, which is sort of the next phase of my own work that I was going to um, have Tom help advise us on is towards a more meaningful science, towards a more inclusive science. And a lot of um, the insights that come from McLeish's work, he would say, come from learning how to talk to people, the chemists, for example, and not just the physicists, because the chemists look at the problems he was looking at as a physicist, look at soft matter, they look at it very differently. But he would then say, of course, very productively. And when they learned how to talk past those differences, there would often be very great insights. And so I think, you know, interdisciplinarity is a complicated issue and it's often said to be desirable, but it's death for your career. But in reality, it's actually deeply important. And the work of Tom McLeish shows that this perspectival difference in science, Kuhn points out, is unquestionably real. It does create serious problems of understanding, you could say, across borders. And that can limit um, knowledge because it can create too narrow of a specialization. At the same time, if we learn to recognize these different perspectives have a, a type of validity, then we can be open to learning from each other. And I would say that whether or not you are a scientist, that's a very good characterization of knowledge generally. Is In general, I think no human community that in any sense seems to be flourishing, surviving, has everything wrong. And this is an incredibly important idea that um, challenges our idea of science as, again, either individual geniuses um, or people failing to make these contributions. It's really a community effort. And at the same time, science isn't you're either 100% right or you're 100% wrong. And this is something that, um, that Fleck in his book talks about, if I can find the passage very quickly. But I'm paraphrasing, almost quoting him when he says, this isn't how science works. The scientific theory or fact isn't 100% right or 100% wrong. You could say that a scientific fact that ends up being valid is a scientific fact that's productive, right? There are errors that end up being productive. Um, if you call an error a fact when you know it's an error, that's a conceptual confusion. But one of the complexities of facts is there can be aspects of facts that are correct, based on our current understanding and aspects of the fact that are no longer correct. And so we tend to just forget those parts that don't meet current theory, and then they forget our theory when it's replaced. And so as a result, it does look like when you look at history, basic facts don't change. And this is people often misunderstand Kuhn. Well, am I not lecturing at a desk? Is this not a sure mic? Aren't these facts? Yes. But me pointing out this is a sure mic doesn't really add anything to science. Um, if you actually then got into a detailed characterization of the scientific theory that governs the physical acoustics of what's happening as I speak into this uh, microphone, which I certainly don't know, but I imagine is very, very complex because it would have to do with theories of waves in physics, and it would have to do with whatever the cutting edge theories are of the different parts, acoustics and the physics of sound waves, and then how it's applied in this mechanical instrument. That's a very complicated fact, right? So in other words, the fact that this is a microphone of a certain brand is the sort of fact we say, well, facts are facts. Yes, facts are facts in a sense when they don't matter because we're in a community in which we know what things are. But if I was talking to someone who didn't know what a microphone was, I couldn't say this is a sure mic and it mean anything. If I knew a person just thought this could be anything like a stick, Imagine a person who has no concept even of electricity. They see this object. Of course, they don't know it's a microphone. It would sound like magic. So how do I explain it to them? 
now you're beginning to think like a teacher has to think, right? How do you explain something to a person who doesn't have the conceptual repertoire inside of which certain things become obvious? So this is a very deep idea. The, and this is what's so important. And I, I think in a way, Flex Book is still too ahead of us. I think Kuhn's book is a, is a better book to get into the topic because Flex Book is more almost immediately radical. Um, but we'll see this becomes a central issue is that what is a fact in science changes when science changes. What is a fact in science changes when science changes. And certainly the meanings of facts in science are always changing and they're always being reinterpreted. And so you could say a, a kind of failure of a fact comes when the fact is no longer even used as something to interpret. And this then leads you to have different data. But when you have a theory, you'll share data, but you may not share interpretations of data. And in this context, then, the emergence of communities of rules will often be, as Kuhn points out, a way that different schools emerge. So, for example, you could say that Sabine Hassenfeld, insofar as she's successful, she's trying to found a type of anti-aesthetic school of physics heuristics, saying let's not look for beauty in theories, let's look for these other criteria. So that's not a new paradigm. Um, it's a new set of rules, or you could say she wouldn't say it's all original, but she's proposing a set of, she thinks, prudent rules that would change the paradigm in science by helping us come up with a better one. And so the priority of paradigms in this case means that this intervention is being made in the context of the scientific community. And this is where Cohn uses the term paradigm in a way that I think is very confusing because it's not wrong, but you have to understand he means here a thought collective, but in the special sense of the scientific community. So in other words, the scientific community isn't just like any other thought collective. It doesn't just change its mind. You could say for... Uh, you know, historical or arbitrary reasons, we it's hard to make sense of retrospectively, like in moral formation or changes like this. We would just say, well, we finally understood the truth. Well, as we know from, again, the history of activism that requires these moral transformations, it's not that simple. But when you've successfully instituted the the instauration or the inauguration of a fact, then the benefit of it is if you're successful, the fact becomes obvious and then maybe people de maybe people debate what is the fact what does it really mean but you don't debate anymore that it is a fact so facts are social products of community knowledge you don't have isolated facts people who had facts that were only facts for them couldn't talk about those facts with anyone else and so you know Kuhn talks about Wittgenstein in this context I'm not going to get into that but he uses this idea of family resemblance which is to say Families look similar not because there's some single shared property or set of single shared properties that everyone in the family all has. Rather, Wittgenstein uses the idea there's something that he calls a family resemblance, which is a kind of single intuitive concept where we can tell someone's from the same family. But it's not because there's a part that we're recognizing they all have. It's more like there's an intuition of a whole that they all come from. And so, in other words, it's a gesture towards, I think, the communal nature of a certain type of scientific perception. Or you could say something that at a micro level is an example of a gestalt in gestalt psychology or a whole form that you intuit at once. And this issue then of the fact that the facts that you see change depending on the perspectives you have. And the facts that you share themselves imply that you're a part of a shared theory means in deep periods of crisis, in any community of knowledge, scientific community is what we're talking about, could be a religious community, any community that thinks they know things, in a deep period of crisis, people won't share the same facts. And so you can see now, and I don't want to politicize this or make this too applicable, but if you look at the news and you look at our so-called post-truth age, the relevance of Kuhn is we actually have this problem in our society today. We don't agree on what facts are. And understanding how this works in a very rigorous context, like knowledge giving science, helps us at that rigorous level then think creatively and analogically will make this apply to how we think about media and other things. And I think it has great implications for that. So the point of this chapter, and for me this section, is to recognize that in order to really understand the development of scientific change, you have to understand that communities stabilize a type of productive disagreement a spectrum of productive disagreement. 
And the spectrum of productive disagreement often doesn't need to be formalized or made explicit. We don't have to say what we all agree on. If we agree on things, we don't have to talk about it. That's a general rule. That when you have really deep paradigmatic agreement, you learn how to do things the same way. You share what Polanyi would call tacit knowledge. Knowledge in your body, in your being, that's very real, but you can't make fully explicit. And so Kuhn cites Polanyi to this effect in this section, and rightly so, because the priority of paradigms has to do with the fact that scientific progress is a communal process, but part of the emergence of productive disagreement is seen in actually, you could say, sometimes quite vehement disagreements about whether people are even doing science. And when people are arguing, is that person even really a scientist? There's a sense in which what you know is they're so theoretically distant from that person that they don't perceive their way of practicing science to be intelligible based on the rules that they have. Even if, say, those people broadly share the same models um, or the same paradigm. And so I think Kuhn, if you read this section, is struggling to make sense of this issue. And what he's struggling to make sense of is how can we show that the thought change of the thought collective of the scientific community is rational? Um, and, he, and, he's, and basically, at every given instance of a debate, like a fractal from the community into a specialized theory, into a subspecialized theory, people will agree on basic things. And then the more problems there are with the theory, the more you will get innovative attempts to reinterpret the facts until eventually you start reinterpreting the theory. And so a reinterpretation of facts can lead to the recognition that these facts are so theory laden that you start thinking about the concepts that structure the fact, which is a very deep idea. That's why I'm introducing it in this episode because I want to explore it over the next three or four episodes is the idea that we create facts, which does not mean facts aren't facts. I mean, it means that the important facts that we have are symptoms of a profound form of social agreement that's usually tacit and that we're unaware of. And so you could say, using the language of Berger and Lugman, facts are created within what they call plausibility structures, or facts are constituted in flex language by a denk collective. Without a thought collective and without a shared style of thought, you won't get shared agreement about what facts are, how to interpret them, or how to use them. And therefore, as styles of thought change or separate, you get a kind of alienation or distancing from people who share similar theories, even like quantum mechanics, but they don't think about the meaning or the interpretation of the theory the same way. And therefore, it feels quite different to different people. And so I would say the big lesson here is learning to live with the reality of diversity and the, in, the validity of different perspectives as a fact. But the fact is those different perspectives can lead to a lot of confusion in science. I mean, they can lead also to a lot of conflict that is productive and unproductive. And we'll see that the conflict in science begins to develop a lot of heat, you could say, when you get the emergence of what Kuhn calls anomalies, things that threaten the apparent coherence of the theory because they don't fit inside of it. And my hope has been to set up to this discussion of Fleck, the example of Zabina Hassenfeld in the contemporary debate about what are the proper rules to govern physical research or scientific research in general, we're going to be in a better position to understand the very crucial idea of what is an anomaly, which we'll see is central to Kuhn's idea of a paradigm shift or a scientific revolution. And that's all structured, as we've seen, in the context of the deeper question of now that we know the scientific community as a community is the real base of knowledge, not individual scientists. And now we know that the scientific community evolves in such a way that looks apparently contradictory because the theories don't blend into each other. They, be, they seem really incoherent if you stick them next to each other. But over time, there's absolutely clear progress that everyone in science recognizes. So how do you make sense of that? And again, we haven't really answered that, but we put some more of the puzzles onto the table. And the crucial anchor of all these puzzles is, what is a fact? What is a scientific fact? And we see that a scientific fact is something that has a history. It's something that develops. And I'll give an example of that in a more concrete way in the next episode. I thank you very much for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, introduction to Kuhn's work. My name is Samuel Lankar. I'm a philosopher and historian of science and religion, the editor-in-chief of the Marginalia Review of Books and the director of its Meanings of Science project, and I'm the founder of the Becoming Human project. 
please do like this video if you've enjoyed it. Share it with your friends. Um, subscribe to the channel. I will be teaching a seminar, a very small seminar, for a few people, an advanced seminar, you could say on Kuhn, um, starting in a few weeks. Uh, some of you have already reached out. I think there is a space or two potentially left, but um, I'm trying to figure out the final things for that. So if you're interested in that, send me a note uh, through my website and check out the Becoming Human Project. Thank you very much for joining me. May you find the way into all your ways.